Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My dear friends, he bit the bullet, he kicked the can, he bought the farm, he checked into the horizontal Hilton, he's taking a dirt nap, he expired. Now I could probably go on and on, but I think you get the point. We have come up with an awful lot of ways to talk around something that is deadly serious. Something that we don't like to admit, something that we don't want to face, and that is death and dying. And because we don't want to face death and dying, you can see how much we try to prevent it. In fact, people will spend thousands of dollars on procedures, on treatments, on anti-aging ointments. Even I've heard people will try and preserve their body by having it frozen just minutes after their death in the hope that someday they'll be able to bring them back to life. We don't like to face the fact that 100% of people in this world born before us and after us will eventually face their maker. That 100% of us sitting right here today will eventually die unless our Savior comes back first. And yet, when you look at the word of the Apostle Paul today, a man who had faced death probably more than any of us combined... He not only embraces death, but he looks forward and rejoices for his coming death because he knows what comes next. He knows exactly what has happened because of his Savior's resurrection from the grave. And so on this last Sunday of the church year, we celebrate that glorious resurrection and the day that we too will get to see our Savior and our King in heaven. We read today the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the people of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when he says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that it does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. And when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now I think in some ways these words of the Apostle Paul seem perhaps a bit morbid. After all, he is showing us the plain fact that we are going to die like it or not. And he points us back to this passage. For as in Adam, all die. He points back to the fact that our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin and brought this world under the curse, under the plague of death. There is no escaping that. And then he reminds us that this death is the harshest pronouncement of God's law against us. He says to us later, for the wages of sin is death. And just like our first parents, Adam and Eve, we continue to fall into the sins of our parents. And we continue to make up our new sins each and every day. We are just as much to blame for all the evil in this world. We are just as much to blame for the death that we deserve. But yet still, we want to push it off. We don't like to talk about it. We want to talk 
around death, don't we? And you think about it when somebody has passed away from this life. Death is all around us. You open up the newspaper and, and you see those obituary pages. You turn on the evening news and death is there. You see it among your own friends and family and likely some of you have attended a funeral for a loved one this past year. You see it in your own body. Because your own body from the moment that you were conceived is pretty much a ticking time bomb ready to go off at any time. And even for all the advancements in science, even for all the ointments and the treatments, this is what's coming. We can't avoid it. Death is there for each of us. But then when somebody dies, still we try and disguise it, don't we? We buy that fancy casket, pretty much a box that we put in the ground, never to be seen again, only to rot away. We sit there as the mortician tells us, well, you can do the upgrades, the brass hinges, silk sheets, and the bells and whistles that come with it, and they get to us in our time of grief and sorrow. And then what happens next? We argue over what they're going to wear. We argue over who gets the house, who gets the larger share of the inheritance. We do all these things to disguise the fact that we're not going to see them again this side of heaven. And why do we do all those things? Is it perhaps at times we feel a bit, guilt, a bit guilty because we've neglected them during their life? Is it maybe we feel a, a bit guilty because they were going down the wrong path and, and we did nothing to try and bring them back, maybe using even some tough love to do it? Or maybe it's because we realize that someday we're going to be lying there too. And we hope that someone would do the same thing for us. Death is coming. And really, if that's it, then it would be very hopeless and we would be certainly lost. We would be dead. And we can talk around death all we want. We can dress it up and mock it on Halloween, but it is still going to be waiting for each of us eventually. That's why we need someone who can do something about it. That's why we need someone who can come and make things right, someone who can come and do the impossible for us. Because, my dear friends, we can not only soften death's blow, but we can eliminate the victory and the sting that death has over each and every one of us. It goes back to the words of the Apostle Paul as he said, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is is your sting. It's because of those words, my friends, that as Christians, when a fellow brother or sister in Christ, a father, a mother in Christ, a, a son or daughter in Christ has passed away, that we know what comes next. We don't have to mourn. We don't have to have the sorrow that the world has because we have the sure and certain hope, the assurance that heaven is waiting for them. The fact is, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we look at death in a completely different way. You notice how the Apostle Paul describes it. He describes it as a sleep. And that's not just a cute term he uses to, to walk his way around something so deadly serious. It is just a sleep. For as a Christian, we know that when we close our eyes to this world, immediately we open them up to the glories of heaven. Immediately. We're not going to be left behind to go around and, and haunt people and, and think that we can get back at them. We're not going to be left behind to, to make it up to God in some halfway in-between place. No, we have the victory already. That victory over sin, the victory over death that our Savior has won for us. 
And now, my friends, heaven is ours. Not because of something that we did, but it all goes back to what Christ did for us. He did the impossible. He came into this world and for 33 years, living in a world of sin and death, a world surrounded by temptation, never once did he fall. Never once did Jesus fail. But Jesus was willing to give his life for us. Not to just make our life better for the few years that we have here on earth, but to make our life better for eternity. So that we can enjoy all the blessings and all the benefits of heaven. And it's for that reason that often at a Christian funeral, you see people with smiles on their face, people laughing, because they know that that faithful Christian has now been called home to be with their Father in heaven. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has often been called the resurrection chapter of the Bible, and for good reason. If you're ever looking for passages that prove the resurrection, passages to, to help you understand what the resurrection means, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. After all, the Apostle Paul was, was in some ways combating some false ideas. People like the Sadducees who believed that there was no such thing as the resurrection. That's why Paul writes these words. If Christ had not been raised, your faith is in vain. To put it another way, if Christ has not been raised from the grave, then you have no reason to be here this morning. If Christ has not been raised from the grave, you certainly would have no hope for this life and no hope for the one to come. You see, my friends, the resurrection of our Savior is what our faith stands upon. If you get rid of it, it topples like a house of cards. And yet there are still plenty of so-called Christian experts out there who claim that Jesus didn't really have to rise from the grave. In fact, they don't even want to believe that he went through the crucifixion and that he died for the sins of the world. And I suppose that makes sense because the world has always tried to find to disprove Jesus, to doubt what Jesus has done for us. But here in our lesson today, the Apostle Paul snaps us back to reality. He takes us back to the facts that Jesus did come into this world, that Jesus was crucified on the cross, that Jesus gave his life for the sins of the world, and that his cold, lifeless body was laid in that cold, dark tomb but that three days later, Jesus came out of that tomb. That Jesus was alive and hundreds of people were witness to it. And then as he left, telling the disciples, I'm coming back, be ready. I'll come back in all my glory to bring you home. Now during the season of end time, we hear that an awful lot, to be ready, to be prepared to wait for our Savior. But maybe you're sick of hearing that. Maybe you're sick and you're saying, you know what, Lord, I'm sick and tired of struggling with my health with the effects of age. Lord, I'm sick and tired of struggling to, to make ends meet, of, of looking for a new job. Lord, I'm sick and tired of being part of this sinful world. Just come back now. Don't make me wait. Why not you just bring heaven down to earth for me? Why can't you be that bread king that everyone else wanted? Why can't you just be that magic good luck charm King Jesus that would give me everything now? But my dear friends, as hard as this is to hear, Jesus did not come into this world to give you a better life here. I know we don't want to hear that, especially in tough times. And our Lord and Savior did not come into this world simply to defeat earthly enemies or get back at people who have done wrong to us. You probably don't want to hear that either. 
But Jesus came into this world to defeat the greatest enemy, to defeat the devil's false claim on your life and your soul. And he has defeated him. But he also came to defeat the greatest enemy of all, the enemy of death. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when our Savior comes back, my friends, death will be defeated. As Christians standing there on the last day, we will never have to face another day of sorrow or pain or sickness or disease. We will never have to experience loss. We will never ever see death again. Instead, we will be with our Savior, reigning with Him as kings and queens forever. We will be there with our King, the King who has defeated death, the King who is better than any king out there, a different sort of king, the King who has given us eternal life. And so, my friends, whether your DOA whether you're pushing up daisies, or whether you have kicked the oxygen habit, you know what comes next. That death is only asleep. And that you will wake up, and you will join with all the faithful brothers and sisters to receive the crown of life in heaven, given to you by your faithful king where you will reign with him as a king and queen forever. Amen. <laughs>